so guys the second last part of the session we are commencing now so which is about evaluating algorithms uh, frankly this is not very much different from uh, sorry not different but this is not very difficult this is something which is very simple very easy and very intuitive to understand there is nothing maths much involved if you are someone who is scared of maths and statistics and all the thing that we have been doing around logistic regression and linear regression don't be scared what we are going to do right now is something which is very very simple and very very intuitive and easy to understand so let's get started right yeah so what do we have here so evaluation matrix for logistic regression so as we already know we use different matrix for regression and classification what were the matrix for regression again so we use msc loss and then we use residual square we have used couple of those error right so we know those, those how they work and all of that so right now what we are going to do is we are going to check out what are the metrics for classification obviously MSE is for regression problem and accuracy is something that we uh, do we know what accuracy is don't worry we'll kind of understand accuracy in a bit but what we know is that MSE was something that we used for regression loss can we use MSE again for measuring how good our algorithms perform for classification tasks is it is it a good measure the answer is it's probably not a good measure but definitely a valid measure so even if you calculate MSC, if your model is some model is really bad and some model is really good, you would be able to see the distinction using MSC as well, right? So this the, and why do you think so is the case? Because we have already explained why MSC loss is a good loss to explain model performance, right? We have already seen that when I had explained you when I had introduced the idea of negative log likelihood just in the previous session. So when we introduced negative log likelihood, I already showed you MSC loss was somewhat good, except that it was not the best one. So same way, MSC is something that you can still use, but probably not the best idea, but it's definitely a valid idea. So now given that we know that, so what are some of the other measures that we can use for evaluating a logistic regression? So first up, before we go to this example, let's first understand what is logistic regression what is what does accuracy even mean so we saw something called accuracy right so what is accuracy accuracy is basically number of examples you have predicted right right so total number of examples that you have predicted correctly so first let's first before we get into all of this let's first build something which is called a confusion matrix though the name is misleading it's not really as much confusing uh, but please please uh, just pay attention slightly and you trust me you won't get ever confused in this so what is a confusion matrix it's a 2 by 2 matrix so what do you have here so here you have the here you have the actual values right on the top you have the actual values on the left you have the predicted values so your actual values could be positive and negative and your predicted values could be positive and negative right so this is exactly what a con confusion matrix looks like so you have actual values and you have those those actual would be belonging to either class 0 and or class 1 and your predicted could belong to class 1 or class 0 remember this confusion matrix is only for cases where your classes can only fall into two categories 0 or 1 right so what is what is this particular confusion matrix what is this box this box basically constitute of examples which are predicted positive and is also actually positive right so there is something which you have predicted it as positive so which means its probability was greater than the threshold that you have set that you have uh, the, is, that means its probability of those examples were greater than the threshold that you have set and uh, yeah so what are these called these are called true positives right so these are positive examples which you have predicted as positive and they were true because they were predicted positive and they were actually true as well so what is this particular example so these are the ones which you have predicted as positive but they're not really positive they are negative examples they're actually negative they are belonging to class zero right but you have predicted them as positive so if you have predicted them as positive but they're not really positive they're false positive right so they are predicted positive but they are false this is predicted positive but it's actually true this is predicted positive but it is false so similarly these are the examples which are negative what are negative examples again negative examples are those where your probability the one that you obtain from the s curve is lower than the threshold that you have selected so for all of those examples, your predicted example is negative and they are actually positive examples right 
So they are negative exam, they are predicted as negative but they are not really negative. So what are they? They are false negatives. Right? And what is this? By default they are negative and they are, they are actually predicted negative and they are also negative. Right? So they are true negative. So just a quick way to remember them is this. Right? So this positive negative that you see is basically for the prediction. So if it's predicted positive it's and it's negative, it's false positive. It's predicted positive and it's true. It's true positive. It's predicted negative and it's false which means it's negative prediction but actual value is positive then it's false negative. So this is what is a confusion matrix. So based on that confusion matrix now we can define accuracy very easily. right? So what is our accuracy now? Accuracy is basically the number of examples which we have picked correctly. right? Divided by the total number of examples. The total number of examples is TP plus FP plus Fn plus Tn, right? So these are the total number of examples. Out of them, how many have we picked up correctly? So we have picked this one up correctly and we have picked this one up correctly, right? So true positive plus true negative. So these are the ones we have correct. So these are the ones predicted positive and they were actually positive as well. So this is the one which were predicted negative and they're actually negative as well, right? So this is accuracy that we already know somewhat if you are, I'm not sure if you know about this but this is easy right this is not easy to understand of the total number of examples which were the ones which we have predicted correctly. So when correctly I mean both predicted correctly positive predicted correctly negative right. So now let's go and kind of understand why. So now the second question kind of kind of before we kind of go back to the slides. So let's talk about this but let's go back to the slides and understand the first example. So we are trying to detect credit card fraud and occurrence of fraud is 3 in 1000. Right and at times it could be even worse. So now let's go back to our real life example and see how we are going to solve uh, if accuracy is even a good metric always or not. Right. So what we are going to do is let's go through this particular example mentioned on the slides. So we are trying to detect credit card fraud. Occurrence rate of fraud is 3 in 1000. Right. So let's say our model predicted the table as follows, right? So this is the confusion matrix that you have already seen, right? So you have predicted it as fraud and it is actually a fraud. That is called true positive, right? So this is there are one true positive out of thousand cases. So there are you have predicted it as fraud, but it's not fraud, right? So that is called a false positive. So there's one false positive and there's two false negative and 996 true negatives right so this is how let's say any random model something that you have built up looks like so what is the problem with this so let's say we calculate accuracy how what does accuracy come out to be accuracy of this particular model is so this is how it looks right one one two nine nine six right so accuracy is calculated as 1 plus 996 by 1000 right so what does this number come out to be it is 99.7 percent accurate right so you can clearly see this is a very high number right this is a very high number it's very easy to kind of get misled by this that we have a model which performs 99.7 percent accuracy but what you see here is in real life so these are actually the total examples, right? So out of three fraud cases, there were three fraud cases in the thousand, right? You could only pick one. You missed out on the two examples, right? You see this, these are false negatives. So false negatives are the ones which are actually positive, but you predicted them as not positive. So they were actually fraud. So there were two cases. Now let's go back to the slide and see. These are two cases which were actually fraud, but you did not pick them. So out of only three examples, your job was of the model was to basically pick up those three. It failed out of two out of them, right? So two out of those cases it did not pick up. So that's a really bad model, right? You, all you had to do was pick up three cases and you couldn't even pick up two out of them, right? So that's a really bad model. But you see accuracy number, that number is absolutely, absolutely no relation to all of this, right? It just predicts 99.7 percent because clearly you have an example where there are 99, 996 examples you have picked up correctly. But we really don't care, right? If a bank, imagine you are a bank, right? Do you really care about how many not fraud cases you have picked up correctly? You really don't. You, what you care is how many of the fraud cases you picked up because that's your goal of the task. Your goal is not really about, okay, let me also see how not fraud cases are picked up. So these are basically examples of class imbalance problems. Class imbalance problems are those problems 
where particularly one class is supremely important to you and that class whichever class is important is not present in so in this case there are only three out of those so three classes uh, sorry the out of the three examples in thousand only uh, only those three are belonging to positive class the rest 997 of them, of them are belonging to the negative class so there's a class imbalance right so the positive class is extremely low in frequency as compared to the uh, negative class the negative class is 997 positive class is 3 right so given that is a scenario you don't want to go ahead and uh, use this kind of a model as it is so but obviously as you have seen accuracy is not a good metric to judge this kind of models right you're positive you don't want to miss out on frauds but clearly if you use accuracy you are not getting a really good idea right so let's now what what could be some intuitive intuitive ways you can come up with so i would ask, suggest you take some time think about this think about what are the uh, what are some of those metrics that you would want to design to come up and counter this problem right i hope now you have taken some time out to think about some of the accuracy metrics that you want to come not accuracy performance metrics that you want to come up with so now we have a list here somewhere uh, in the slides you can see here so the first step is confusion matrix uh, we have already discussed that apart from that the rest of the things are something we have not understood clearly so we'll kind of go through them right now so confusion matrix is something that you already understand i have already explained to you so true positive true negative false positive false negative right and this kind of a confusion matrix is very good to kind of gain a granular understanding of where your model is going wrong so if you ever get stuck in a model and your model is really not picking up the fraud cases correctly it might be a good idea to go and check the confusion matrix about which are the examples it is not picking up correctly and of the ones that is actually uh, predicted as correctly what is happening with them right so what we know is that from confusion matrix we can calculate accuracy and accuracy is definitely not a good measure to check for if there's something which is very critical to you and that is present in very less numbers in the data set so in, apart from fraud data set you can think of imbalanced data set like a cancer detection right for example out of thousand patients you would end up with two people having cancer right so same kind of this problem remain the problem nature of the problem is the same right you have a positive class which is extremely low in frequency and the negative class which is extremely high in frequency so if that is the case you don't want to use accuracy because accuracy then kind of you know is not agnostic to class imbalances it just predicts you a very high number even though your model the only job where your model was supposed to do is not doing so now you can see you can use uh, so i'm not going to go ahead and uh, explain the so you can kind of it's it's not there's nothing actually to explain about this you can see the confusion matrix being imported and the confusion matrix for test and prediction is given by the current so out of uh, so this was from so this is for the test and the prediction that we had used for the bank loan data set so for the same data for the same model that we have used logistic regression you can see how the confusion matrix looks like so now i'm going to talk to you about about two more important concepts precision and recall so you have already understood why accuracy is not a good matrix i've already shown you an example where there were three fraud cases and out of them you couldn't pick up two of them and you still had a model accuracy of 99.7 percent so now let's understand how do you counter those kind of situation so there are two matrix precision and recall recall is basically nothing but to put in short its accuracy but only when you consider true classes as in the positive classes so how do you calculate precision and recall so precision is basically recall let's first say recall because recall is easy to understand recall is basically of all the positive classes how many did you pick up correctly so in this case in our model we had three positive cases out of which we could only pick up one of them correctly right so if you go back to this example so there were total all in all three classes out of which we could only predict one so one out of three which is 33 percent so this is 33.3 is the recall that we have so recall is nothing but accuracy but for ground truth or actual values are product positive if you actual out of the total number of actual values positive how many did you pick up so recall is in terms of now the confusion matrix so what are the total number of examples that are actually positive actually positive is this column right so to tp tp plus fn right 
Out of this, how many did you even pick up correctly? Is TP, right? So these are the ones which are predicted as positive, but are actually also and are in positive also, right? But these are the ones which are positive, which are actually positive, and you have predicted positive in first case and you have predicted negative in the second case, right? So recall is given by this. So of, of all the positive examples, how many did you even pick up correctly? And what is precision? Precision is of all the examples that you predicted as positive, right? So this was of all the examples that were actually positive. Of all the examples that were actually positive. Now in case of precision, what you're trying to check is for all the examples that were predicted positive, how many of them were actually correct? So what are the number of examples you predicted as positive? So these are the ones you have predicted as positive, right? So out of them, again, TP is the correct number of examples that you have picked up correctly. So TP plus FP. So those are the total number of examples that you have predicted positive and out of them, they are actually have been predicted correctly is TP, right? So recall is basically of all the actual positive values, how many you picked up correctly and precision is of all the predicted positive values, how many were picked up correctly, right? So now if you do the same thing, so recall is 33%, let's calculate the precision. Precision is one out of one plus one, right? So one out of one plus one, which is one by two, 50%. So this model, as you have seen is very bad, right? So you have a very low recall number and not so good even a precision number. But you see the accuracy number, the accuracy number is super high right here. But the precision numbers are very bad, right? So you don't want to go ahead with a model like this. But if you used an accuracy kind of a blanket matrix, then you see that that is absolutely agnostic to your model performance. So this is the reason why we need precision and recall, right? So this is precision and recall are one of the ways where you can counter the class imbalance problem and basically, you know, so, so for a lot of business problem, it, and almost probably almost say 60-70% of the business problem, you are never concerned about picking up accuracy because accuracy is something which is extremely blanket. It is class agnostic and all of that. So you don't want to use accuracy. Depending on your problem, you could be, so if you're someone who is really concerned about fraud detection. So you have, in case of fraud detection, you are very concerned about the fact that of all the examples of all the models, actually which are fraud, you should be able to pick them up correctly. Apart from that, you give me another 10, 15 false positive examples, I'm fine with it. But all those three examples that are fraud, you should be able to give me all of them correctly, right? So in those cases, this is something that is, so of all the examples that are actually positive, I really care about picking them up, all of them correctly, right? So you want recall to be at least close to 100%. So bank fraud cases, right? Now for the same problem, you could probably be saying that, okay, I think um, I have a constraint on the number of people who can call and check if there's a fraud or not, right? So in that case, you probably want to have something which is, uh, so you don't want, so you want basically something where you're predicting number of people and you don't want to predict, uh, you are like, okay, I think I can, my only the number of people I have in my call center, they can probably call at max 10 people in a day. So what I'm fine is probably you giving me 10 predictions and out of those 10 predictions, I at least want like three, four of them to be correct, right? So you want the precision number to be a lot more higher because you don't have enough resources to call up people. Probably this is one another example, right? So precision is of all the ones that you tell me are positive, please let's, let's try and make sure that at least all of them are roughly correct, right? So that is roughly a case of 100% precision. So you are not very concerned about if you are being able to pick up all the positive examples correctly, but what you're concerned is at least the ones I'm predicting, I'm very sure about them, right? So that is the difference between recall and precision. And depending on the business case that you might have at your place or wherever you're working on the project that you're working, you could use precision or recall, right? But definitely what we understand is uh, accuracy is definitely not a good measure to use here, right? Uh, So now we have already introduced the formula for precision. So see, so I've already seen what is precision and precision versus recall, right? So there's a trade off. So obviously if you want to be sure, absolutely certain about all the predictions that you're doing, right? 
So if you are someone who's like, I, okay, I think I want limited predictions, but I want to be absolutely sure about them. Then what you're saying is, I want to be very precise, right? Versus say uh, someone who's like, okay, I probably am fine with making some 10, 15, 30 odd false positive predictions. I am fine with making false positive prediction, but at least I will make sure that on the, I am not missing out on something, right? So then you want a higher recall. Obviously you realize there's a trade off. If you want to make, if you are trying to be like very uh, precise, which is basically I'm like, I'm very confident about everything I say, then obviously you would have a very low recall, right? Because then you would be uh, missing out on some of those examples because you are, you want to be absolutely certain of what you're predicting. Versus say in a case you want to kind of say that, okay, I just want to pick up everything correctly. I might have, I might predict 16, 17, 20, 100 false positives. I don't care, but I want to be absolutely sure that I make sure that I pick up everything correctly. So then you have a high recall, but because you will have a lot of false positives, your precision will follow. So there's a trade-off that you have to kind of take care of. So if you have a very high precision, you're likely, if it's obviously in ideal world, you want everything to be high. You want a high precision as well as a high recall. And that's the ideal world. But in real life, if you have a same model, by changing the threshold, you could have a high recall, low precision, or by changing the threshold, you could have low precision, high recall. Sorry. By changing the threshold, you could have high recall, low precision, or low recall, high precision, right? So that's something you have to take a call on depending on the business case that you are working on. Uh, how, how do you want to be sure, absolutely sure that you're not missing out on something or do you want to be absolutely sure that whatever you're predicting is absolutely correct? So obviously there's a trade-off that you have to take and to kind of make sure uh, this, there's one particular score that we call as F1 score, which is nothing but the harmonic mean of precision and recall which is basically to measure how good your model is. So now you, obviously you cannot monitor both of them same time, right? You need some number which kind of combines the performance, right? So if you're obviously, if you want, if you want a model, which is really good, it would have a very high precision and high recall, right? So there's a trade off. So because there's a trade off, you want to kind of maximize both of them, but using a single number, right? So that single number in this case is F1 score. So F1 score is basically to tackle this trade off. So we just use a single number. So which is basically nothing but two into precision into recall by precision plus recall. This is basically nothing but the harmonic mean between precision and recall. So this is, this is the formula that I've already explained to you F1 score. So now let's see the F1 score calculation for the same example. So the bank loan prediction that we have done, we see that the F1 score comes out to be 0.826. Log on to Grey Atoms learning platform to unlock more free content. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates.